the readers of JNMP voted that the development and application of brain imaging techniques has been one of the most important advancements in neurology, neurosurgery and psychiatry over the last hundred years. And of course, we've always been fascinated by the brain, although actually Aristotle thought the brain was a radiator to stop the body overheating. And it was actually Plato who recognized the brain as the seat of all mental processes. But as William Gowers wrote in um, 1888, the nervous system is almost entirely inaccessible to direct examination, which over the years has led to some rather desperate attempts to get a look at what's going on under the bonnet. Now, trepanning usually didn't get, go that well. So in the late 18th century, uh, Franz Joseph Gould proposed that it was possible to study the anatomy and structure of the brain through the shape of the skull. <clears throat> and this led to the practice of phrenology, which was one of the reasons for the popularity of creating death masks in the belief that behavior, including criminal behavior, uh, could be predicted from skull shape. And here you can see the death masks of Napoleon Bonaparte on the left and Ned Kelly on the right. But coming back to neuroimaging, x-rays came along in about 1895, but they didn't help us to see the brain. But it was 1918, uh, an American neurosurgeon called Walter Dandy realized that if you introduced air into the ventricles or into the compartments around the base of the brain and over its surface, it was possible to visualize some of the brain structure. <clears throat> this approach was so successful that it carried on in routine clinical practice right up into the 1970s. It wasn't until 1963 that William Oldendorf did the basic work that allowed Godfrey Hounsfield, who's pictured here, and Alan Cormack not to not only create the first clinical CAT scan, but also to get the Nobel Prize for the work. This is the first clinical CT scan performed on a woman with a suspected brain tumour at Atkinson Morley's Hospital in South London in 1971. And it was around about this time in the early 70s that Paul Lautenberg and Peter Mansfield began work that would lead to the MRI, for which they were also received the Nobel Prize in 2003. MRI resolution has continued to improve with exquisitely detailed images now possible, although the images that you can see here were obtained from post-mortem with about 100 hours of scanning. Also now accurately portray the white matter tracks of the human brain using tractography and one wonders how long it will be before we can achieve a human version of the brain bow, a process which, by which individual neurons in the brain can be distinguished using fluorescent proteins. So up until now we've really only been talking about providing qualitative information. Is the brain tissue abnormal or not? But to progress we really need to be thinking about quantitative data. So these are quantitative multi-parametric maps from a 70 MRI performed in vivo and were provided by Professor Martina Callahan at the Wellcome Center for Hu Human Neuroimaging here at Queen Square. Multi-parametric maps measure physical brain tissue parameters that depend on microstructural tissue composition and in particular can estimate myelin and iron content. So quantitative data allows us to address experimental questions much more directly. And this example here shows brain regions in which greater iron deposition is associated with severity of cognitive symptoms in people with Parkinson's disease. The other important characteristic of brain imaging is the sheer volume of data that it provides. There are about 200,000 voxels in a three Tesla brain scan, each containing important information. In the past, we've had to use data reduction approaches, for example, characterizing cerebral infarction purely in terms of lesion volume. But approaches like machine learning methods are going to allow us to use so-called high dimensional data. And this is an example of where high dimensional uh, data uh, from structural brain imaging has been used to try and predict outcome after stroke. As well as the structure of soft tissues, me measuring cerebral blood flow is also useful. The first attempt was Angelo Masso's 1882 human circulatory balance device, which attempted to non-invasively measure the redistribution of blood to the, uh, to the head during emotional and intellectual activity. In the 1920s, Antonio Igas Moniz completed the first uh, cerebral angiogram on a living person, commemorated uh, by this mural in his hometown of Avanca in Portugal. Portugal. Um, and he's also received the Nobel Prize, but not for angiography, in fact, for his work on uh, human uh, frontal dichotomy for refractory cases of psychosis. So there are a number of other techniques that we use for measuring cerebral blood flow, including xenon, CT, SPECT and PET. 
and of course, functional brain imaging, functional MRI, which is based on the bold signal, a coupling between neural activity and local blood flow that's been known about for over a century and was the basis for Angelo Masso's 1882 uh, device that we just saw. Here you can see a changing pattern of brain activation during attempted hand movement in two recovering stroke patients. fMRI has been hugely influential in neuroscience, but probably hasn't had the impact in clinical decision making that we might have hoped. PET, of course, can be used with a variety of uh, radio ligands, for example, fluorodopa binding, uh, assesses presynaptic dopaminergic function. And here it's showing asymmetrical loss in the putamen with preservation in uh, the chordate in early Parkinson's disease, but with diffuse and symmetrical loss in a patient with progressive supranuclear palsy. On the right, you can see some scans from a patient with temporal lobe epilepsy. The FDG PET shows hypometabolism in the temporal lobe, and the flumazenil PET shows reduced binding to the GABA-A receptors, suggesting that this is the location of the epileptogenic focus, which is confirmed by the statistical comparison with control subjects. Lastly, we should think about uh, remembering the uh, neuroimaging methods that focus on the brain's electrical activity. So Richard Caton was an English uh, physiologist who performed pioneering work studying the electrical activity of the brain in animals. But in 1924, it was Hans Berger who made the first recording of human brain activity, the first EEG. Of course, we now have magnetoencephalography, which records magnetic fields produced by electric currents passing along axons in the brain. So at the bottom left, you can see the signal generated in the sensory motor cortex during a, a simple button press. And you can see that it's complex data and we can characterize it in terms of spatial, temporal and spectral domains. So data like this are complex, but they do lend themselves to computational modeling approaches so that we can begin to make inferences in vivo about things like large scale brain networks and at the same time, small scale intracortical microcircuits. Ultimately, we're going to need to put all of these data together. So this chart illustrates how multimodal longitudinal neuroimaging data can allow deep phenotyping of patients at multiple levels, from molecules to cells to microcircuits to large scale brain networks in a way that can be used to de design more targeted and better stratified clinical trials. <clears throat> The scale of the neuroimaging data available from individuals is becoming vast. And the question is, what do we do with it? So we've seen advances in thinking about how to use big data generated in genomics and proteomics and so on. But now we should apply the same level of thinking to brain imaging data to create the field of brainomics to help the deep phenotyping of our patients. One last word of caution. These words appeared in our very journal. Even with the tremendous advances in diagnostic neuroimaging, Clinical skills involved in clinical neurology, in other words, history, examination, localization, and differential diagnosis remain key. While this, of course, refers to the field of clinical neurology, it also speaks to something that I think is often missing in many areas of clinical neuroscience, and that is fine-grained assessment of behavior. Scientists spend a lot of energy and time on the increasing complexity of the data generated from the study of genes, cells, proteins, and even as we've discussed the brain, but it has to map onto relevant behaviors which are often measured as an afterthought. In the world of movement science, for example, we will need to characterize behavioral changes using lab-based two-dimensional or even real-world three-dimensional kinematics. We have to remember that in some cases, the complexity of the behavioral data will be similar to that seen in genomics or brainomics. So in summary, over the last 100 years, we've gone from the inaccessible to the accessible brain. The quantity of data that we can generate from brain imaging is almost overwhelming. As with many technological advances, the techniques sometimes arrive ahead of the questions. And I think now is the time we need to think carefully about how we use this wealth of information to make sure that we ask the right questions that will benefit our patients the most.